program. It's time for York Universe, a co-production of the Observatory of York University, Toronto, and the Voice of Astronomy. AFM Radio. AFM Radio. AFM Radio. AFM Radio. Hello and welcome to York Universe, the astronomy and astrophysics program written and presented by the students, faculty, alumni, and friends of York University. I'll be one of your hosts this evening. I'm Dr. Elena Hyde, the Observatory Director, and I am joined tonight by two fabulous astronomers. First and foremost, of course, we have Julie Tomei, who is joining us once again on York Universe as our my fabulous co-host. Um, and we have a extra special guest who is coming back, uh, our resident partial expert, Dr. Parandis Tashbach, who is coming in to help us with today's broadcast, as well as talk about some really fun stuff from astronomy history. Just as a reminder, we are broadcasting live from the Allen and Carswell Observatory, located at York University in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. This is Science Night in Canada, where the lineup is all Canadian, starting with ourselves, your universe, and on to Western World, Western World, excuse me, Quirks and Quirks, and Science for the People. York Universe broadcasts every Monday night at 9 p.m. local Toronto time, i.e. right now. Um, or if you're in a different time zone, about at 2 a.m. on Tuesday morning, Universal Time. The York Universe production works in concert with our online public viewing program run by our amazing observatory team. And it's exactly the same hours between 9 to 10 p.m. local Toronto time. You can find us on our website with the links to OPV online public viewing. However, this uh, this episode, I have to tell you, our website has actually changed. If you want to get to the observatory website, you will have to go to www.yorku.ca slash science slash observatory and then follow the links to OPV. If you've got the old website, don't worry, it will redirect you automatically, but our online public viewing broadcast will be showing you lovely, lovely images. No live images tonight, unfortunately, because although it's clear, we actually have to run a pointing model this evening at the one meter telescope. Um, not great for viewing, so we will be showing you some lovely archival images over on our YouTube channel on OPV. Our broadcast is powered by and in partnership with astronomy.fm, the voice of astronomy. If you have any questions or comments or um, uh, fun things you'd like to tell us about our new website, you can email us at observe at yorku.ca. And of course, you can always connect with us over on Twitter with our handle at York Observatory, on Instagram at York U Observatory, and Facebook at Alan I. Carswell OBS. All of our programs are free, but if you'd like a donate, to make a donation, you can, of course, see that new website link at yorku.ca slash science slash observatory. We will be monitoring the chat room for questions and, of course, the post content and all kinds of other fun stuff. The weather is surprisingly clear this Monday night, um, but once again, you will be getting some beautiful archive images because our telescope is occupied running a full pointing model, which will hopefully allow us to navigate around the sky with much greater ease uh, next week. So we have all kinds of great stuff going on tonight. Lots and lots of fun. Um, uh, Julie Parandis, uh, how are you both doing? Uh, Julie, how are you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. And uh, Parandis, keeping a keeping an eye to the sky. Uh, yes, I am, uh, and I'm so happy to be here tonight. Uh, it's a, an exciting time to talk about the moon. <laughs> It is, it is. And of course, we're just coming off the back of a, a full moon and a, a, a Mars occultation and all kinds of moon news. So we'll probably get to some of that later on. Of course, we usually run these shows with a little bit of retroactive. So we're going to start with our um, going back in history with a really quick version of this week in space and astronomy history it's actually just going to be a quick two round uh, blast so i think i'll take a take us over to julie first and um julie if you'd like to take us back to i believe the the fabulous 1970s absolutely uh we are going to december 12th 1970 uh, and the event is that an Italian ground crew becomes the first to launch a satellite for NASA. 
uh, with the launch of the Uhuru satellite from the San Marco launch platform in Kenya. Uh, so the name of the satellite Uhuru comes from the Swahili language uh, where it means freedom. Uh, the satellite was also known as X-ray Explorer satellite, SASA for small astronomy satellite A, um, it being the first of a three uh, spacecraft SAS series or SAS-1 or Explorer 42, but Uhuru is such a prettier name, so we'll go with that. Uh, it was the first satellite launched specifically for X-ray astronomy, and it performed the first comprehensive survey of the entire sky for X-ray sources. Its main objectives were to survey the sky for cosmic X-ray sources in the 2 to 20 kilo electron volt range, it, uh, to determine the discrete source locations with a precision of a few square meters, uh, minutes rather, of arc for strong sources and a few tenths of a square degree at the sensitivity limit. To study the structure of extended sources or complex regions with a resolution of about 30 arc minutes. To determine gross spectral features and variability of X-ray sources and to perform where possible uh, coordinated or simultaneous observ observations of X-ray objects with other observers. Uh, throughout its uh, lifetime, um, it discovered over 300 new X-ray sources, uh, made observation of known X-ray sources like Cygnus X1, it resulted in the first comprehensive X-ray catalog of the sky, and the mission ended in March of 1973. Such a fun mission. And X-ray astronomy really is something that you definitely need um, satellites for. You don't get good pictures of the X-ray sky from Earth, at least not that I've ever, ever seen anyone manage to, uh, to do. And yeah, thank goodness for our atmosphere. Yeah, our, our pesky atmosphere just gets in the way. Um, and it's it's such a different energy realm than what we're used to as well. It's worth noting that this survey of X-ray sources is a survey of, of high energy sources. Yeah, I mean, we're looking at all, all sorts of cool things. Very nice. And some of these targets, of course, have become uh, classics. I remember having to observe uh, one of these, the Vela X1, which I believe was also targeted by Uhuru. Um, yes, it was. And uh, it, back in my, my undergrad in olden times. <laughs> um, very, very, very fun stuff. And of course, I just have to mention, um, you know, you do get, of course, a great natural uh, sci-fi connection because Uhuru is very close to Uhura, who, of course, everyone knows is from the original series Star Trek. So great science and science fiction crossovers. Yeah, absolutely. The name comes from the same place. Uh, Michelle Nichols had a book that had the title Uhuru with her when she went to read for the part. Um, and they were looking for a name for the character, and so they went with Uhura, uh, but it comes from the same, the same Swahili word. Yeah, it's really wonderful stuff. Um, do, you, uh, do you have a favorite x-ray source for Andis? Um, not that I can think of at the moment. <laughs> Cygnus? That's a really, really good one as well. I think that's, um, yeah. that's also very popular to uh, to image in radio, as I've heard. That's true. Um, anyways, studying the, studying the sky for cosmic X-ray sources um, back in the, uh, the fabulous 70s. So wonderful, wonderful stuff. All right, so going through space and astronomy history, I'm going to take us to a little bit of a different uh, location. <laughs> I'm actually going to go um, all the way um, uh, back to Apollo 17. Um, so you might have, some people might remember, I suppose, depending on your, your age, you might remember back in uh, 1972, um, we had Apollo uh, 17, the last moon mission. 
And in particular, I'm going to concentrate on December 11th and 12th of 1972. Um, so more of the fabulous 70s, but uh, we're looking at Apollo 17 and the last um, lunar walk or moon walks. Apollo 17 being the last mission, they kind of knew it would be the last for the, a while. They didn't realize it would be the last for a very, very long while since 1972. Uh, so they did try to get as much walking on the moon as possible. And their first EVA or uh, extra vehicular activity, um, number one, started on December 11th at 115459, so almost midnight and um, went over into December 12. And this is a really interesting one because you had, um, you had two astronauts, um, Harrison Jack Schmidt and Eugene Cernan, who were going on these EVAs, the, as I say, the first, the first one starting on the, the 11th slash 12th. And there's a very, very famous moon clip that you can look up, and I highly recommend everyone to check it out. It is those two astronauts, um, Harrison Jack Schmidt and Eugene Cernan, walking on the moon, skipping merrily, which is fairly difficult, and singing their own version of the song, um, The Fountain in the Park. And I think this is the only musical number ever recorded on the moon. <laughs> Um, and in particular, the uh, the song, if you if you haven't heard it, heard it before, um, I am actually not going to sing it, uh, despite this being a radio show. But the fountain in the park has um, uh, the lyrics, I was strolling on the moon one day in the merry, merry month of May. And so, of course, uh, they sung it in a similar way. But when they got to May, they sort of argued about May or December, because, of course, they were doing this in uh, December. <laughs> but the song lyrics clearly mean May because you need the rhyme. Um, so then they they got to the part of, um, uh, you know, uh, when too much to my surprise, a pair of bonny eyes. They have do a whole series of doop de doops and uh, intercut with, uh, boy, is this a neat way to travel. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's very, very silly, as uh, as much fun as you would hope. And probably, you know, um, if you're thinking about, you know, music and film awards, um, uh, for Earth, there's a lot of competition, but this is by far the, the uh, I don't know, the Oscars or the uh, Golden Globes of moon musicals. So Apollo 17 astronauts, um, Eugene Cernan and Harrison Schmidt, walking and singing along in December of 1972. So we talk about space a lot, but it is worth remembering that, um, you know, a lot of people did have a lot of fun with this as well. <laughs> so if you have time to search up that clip, I, I definitely recommend it. Of course, both, um, both Schmidt and Cernan were very uh, accomplished astronauts as are, um, you know, all astronauts really. Uh, you have to do a lot of training and in the 70s you had to do quite a lot of training. Um, Schmidt, in addition to being a uh, um, somewhat of a lyricist, <laughs> he was also the only geologist in um, in the astronaut car at the time. And we talked about this, uh, I think, uh, one or two episodes ago. Um, getting a geologist on the mission was um, was a priority for scientists because at the time it was pilots who were pre who were usually assigned to be astronauts. You had to have um, some piloting skills, but uh, the scientists revolted, and um, we did get a geologist on the moon, a, a singing and dancing geologist, no less. So, away in 2017. So Schmidt is also the only, uh, the most recent person to have walked on the moon who's who's actually still alive. Um, it is a little bit sad that some of these astronauts are, are passing away now without seeing us go back. So Schmidt was uh, an active um, sort of uh, uh, purveyor documenting Apollo geologic results. And he also took on organizing NASA's energy uh, program office in addition. So it's really fun stuff. Um, Cernan, as I say, he did unfortunately pass away in, in 2017. He was the 11th 
human to walk on the moon. And, you know, as I say, in addition to being somewhat of a, a singer and a dancer, <laughs> he also <laughs> was um, uh, on the thir third and final lunar excursion, um, the last man on the moon. So um, as if he if he was still away, alive, or sorry, if he was still alive, he would potentially be um, the last the last man on the moon uh, to ever, ever have gone there. Um, despite all of our recent progress, we still have not, to date, sent any humans back to the surface of the moon. Um, that might change, hopefully, in the next few years, but um, it hasn't it hasn't yet. So if you're looking for the, uh, the song, <laughs> you can search for The Fountain in the Park on the Moon during Apollo 17. And if you search for Apollo 17, you'll see a lot of shots of CERNIN. And you'll also see a really, really wonderful picture that they took um, from Apollo 17. We've seen some beautiful pictures come back from recent missions, but the blue marble is an iconic photo of Earth uh, from space, which was uh, credited to the, the three crewmen of Apollo 17. So Apollo 17... Um, uh, you know, has all kinds of interesting, uh, you know, fun facts you can look up about it. Um, it was a real moment in history, although we're, we're hoping that it is repeated at some point. It was not just uh, Cernan and Schmidt, but they were also accompanied by Ronald Evans, uh, who was on, on the flight um, uh, as, their, as their command module pilot. And of course, he, he flew them to the moon. And uh, we had just so much going on with this mission. It's kind of amazing that, that you know, no matter how busy people get, uh, people always will want to uh, want to have fun. And Cernan, in, in addition to, of course, singing and dancing, he um, he actually did a uh, a press conference with uh, Snoopy, a famous. Um, uh, um, sort of cartoon character. So, by all accounts, they did, they did have quite a lot of fun with uh, with this mission, and it's it's too bad that it was, um, as I say, the last the last one and the last words ever spoken on the moon by by humans. They did have a successful um, splashdown, returning back to Earth um, after spending. 75 hours of lunar surface stay time and 17 hours in uh, in lunar orbit. They brought back with them 110.4 kilograms of um, uh, moon, moon rocks, uh, lunar material. And, uh, and some, some estimates have been made about that 110 kilograms, just exactly how much that would be worth if you could sell it. Um, I, there is still some problems with uh, with selling moon rocks, so I, I don't think it's allowed. So don't don't buy moon rocks. Um, but very very fun moment in history, and a really interesting uh, little moment in time because it was, of course, um, the 11th and 12th that they were stepping onto the surface of the moon with their EVA number one, uh, which was seven hours and 12 minutes. So the first of several EVAs for this last moon mission. And if we had to go out, at least we went out with a song and a dance. So um, something to remember for the next astronauts thinking of going to the moon, the bar has been set. So pick your song lyrics now. <laughs> <clears throat> you do you have to have a little bit of fun when you're out there? Yeah, and I mean, I'm thinking. I was thinking about it. What song would you bring to the moon uh, to come back to? Mm. Any? So, any uh, uh, actually, I don't have to ask Horrendous. I know you have a song. <laughs> Sorry, I have a song. You uh, you have um, which which one was the. Uh, the the Herschel um, oh yes, the Herschel yes. song that you had um, your son perform uh, yeah he uh, performed Caprice Number One by William Herschel um, that would be so, a very good choice of a song to bring back it doesn't have lyrics though so uh, no no it's just solo violin <laughs> uh, yeah I don't think um, you can play the violin on the moon can you <laughs> you you can play it in the space capsule yeah um, you can yeah. That would be beautiful, really beautiful. 
Um, so we'll bring, we'll bring some Herschel recordings on next. I, I hope they bring some Herschel recordings. That would be wonderful. Yeah. I'd be tempted to start singing Fly Me to the Earth. <laughs> that's a good, that's a very good choice. That's a very good choice. <laughs> Um, I just don't know the lyrics to that many songs. <laughs> um, but you know, pick something, pick something simple and catchy with a really uh, fun lyric you can dance around to. Um, maybe the one that doesn't require musical accompaniment, because of course, as you say, no one was able to play instruments uh, for them as they were dancing around on the surface of the moon, because there's no way to transmit sound um, other than microphones. So you, I suppose you could do a version of um, what's that one? Sing, singing in the rain, but maybe make it make it moon oriented instead. Yeah, definitely no rain on the moon. Uh, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> Have to do some terraforming first. Yeah. Um, I mean, if it was raining something, it's more likely to be uh, meteorites. So that would be to be avoided. <laughs> yes, definitely. Um, anyways, huge shout out to um, some very uh, sort of fun-loving astronauts back in the uh, in the year of 1972. Um, so the, actually, this is all of our this week in space and astronomy history because our main discussion is also history. So I'm gonna do a couple reminders a little bit earlier than we usually do in this show. Um, we have a very, very interesting, uh, fun guest talk coming up on this Wednesday on our Teletube broadcast. That's our YouTube channel that runs every Wednesday that we're not doing in-person tours. And you will have to go to the new website. That's right. We have a new website um, eh, by no choice of our own. <laughs> um, and you can all note this down. It's www.yorku.ca slash science slash observatory. And if you go to the old one, don't panic. It will take you there automatically because a redirect has been set up. You'll see the Teletube YouTube links. And this Wednesday, we have one of the York University's grad students, Connor Hayes, coming in to talk about his research. So this is a chance to actually hear about research that's going on right now at the university from one of our own grad students, which is really, really fun and highly recommended for students and amateurs alike. Um, if you are having trouble finding the Wednesday link, you can always go straight to YouTube and just search for Alan A. Carswell Observatory York University and the YouTube channel will pop right up. It has all of our talks on it. 7.30 p.m. Uh, Eastern Time will be the start and you can tune right in right there. So for our main part of tonight's episode, um, we are going to talk about a really fun giant moment in history, the Great Moon Hoax. So that's right, this is very moon oriented. <laughs> so very, very lunar oriented. And what better time to start discussing uh, disinformation in the media and um, the moon. <laughs> so <laughs> all of this is very, very topical. The Great Moon Hoax, if you haven't heard about it, it was um, run in 1835. That's right, 1835. Um, it actually began on August 25th in 1835, so it's technically not a This Week in History, but it was about supposedly the discovery of life and even civilization on the moon. That's right, um, and the, the discoveries were falsely attributed to Sir John Herschel, who was um, at that time, and I think even today, well known as a, an extremely prominent astronomer. So the story was advertised in uh, August 21st, 1835, as an upcoming feature allegedly reprinted from another newspaper. So this is the first hint that maybe something uh, is not quite right, because it's a, it's a feature reprint from somewhere else that you didn't really know about. Um, and uh, the, uh, the uh, pictures are lithograph lithographic pictures drawn. Um, and they actually have some lithographs that you can find if you look this, this hoax up. So they actually published 
uh, the first in a series of six, four days later on August 25th. And so the headlines read things like, great astronomical discoveries lately made. Um, so it doesn't sound like clickbait to us now, but it definitely was clickbait of the time. They had man bats, uh, no Batmans, but man bats. Um, they had, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, civilizations, goats, uh, unicorns, I believe, were in there somewhere. Um, <laughs> and uh, the articles came out and they, they looked just good enough, apparently. Um, and, uh, you know, um, now it is kind of debated about whether or not it might have been uh, satire. Because, of course, you get more and more ridiculous uh, claims as, as you start reading further and further. Um, bipedal tailless beavers, I think, was one. <laughs> so um, the great uh, moon hoax is kind of an example of lots of different things all smushed together. Uh, but they definitely an, uh, an exercise in critical reading um, and, you know, a conspiracy theory for the ages, if you will. So uh, people still sometimes question the Apollo moon landings. Um, and, but, you know, this particular uh, hoax was, um, you know, uh, pretty, pretty fun by today's standards. It's uh, there's life on the moon and the civilization. <laughs> so um, it kind of has a, a, an awesome uh, tilt to it. So the hoax is, um, now well known as a hoax. We have very, very good images of the moon where there are clearly not um, tailless bipedal beavers uh, <laughs> of any kind. Also not even air to transmit sound. So, you know, singing is a problem. Um, but uh, it, it does still have a lot of really interesting aspects. So I think let's, uh, let's start by handing this over to our, our resident uh, Herschel expert. <laughs> Uh, Parendis, um, how what's your take on this story? Well, uh, this is a uh, fascinating story that I think should be read uh, in its own time and space uh, so people realize why it had such a great impact. Basically, uh, this was a time like 1835, the 19th century, beginning of the 19th century was a time that um belief in the existence of extraterrestrials um even in the solar system uh was uh, something quite uh, you know popular so i would say uh, maybe even more than today uh people believed for centuries people had believed that uh the universe is populated by intelligent beings uh and this goes back actually all the way to the time of um pythagoras who argued that the moon is actually inhabited by beings who are 15 times uh, more superior in terms of beauty uh, than those that inhabit the earth. So for centuries, people were actually thinking that the moon is inhabited. There were uh, proposals put forward uh, towards the end of the in, um, 18th century, beginning of 19th century, as to how to communicate with uh, the civilization that uh, potentially exists on the moon. One of them was uh, allegedly put forward by the prince of uh, mathematics. Ethics, Gauss, um, by um, where he basically suggested that a version of the windmill um, proof of the Pythagorean theorem uh, be produced, like a huge image of it, uh, in Siberia uh, by uh, basically uh, farming wheat, you know, by um, planting seeds of wheat, and then the color contrast is going to show the people of the moon that we are intelligent and we have mathematics. So people were waiting for it, and this came out at the time uh, when everyone, uh, was waiting um, that with the emergence of better telescopes, uh, in fact, uh, life on the moon soon is going to be discovered. And of course, uh, you talk about Herschel. I should mention that Herschel himself believed, uh, William Herschel, the father, uh, believed that moon is inhabited. And his son, John Herschel, who went on to become, again, one of the most prominent astronomers of the 19th century, he also believed that the moon was inhabited, but he 
mentioned apparently that we need better telescopes in order to see it. So the man who fabricated uh, this whole um, uh, story of discovery of uh, civilization on the moon, John, Lo- um, sorry, uh, Richard Adams Locke, uh, he read somewhere that um, John Herschel, uh, the son of the great astronomer, William Herschel, is saying that if you have a good enough telescope, you're very likely to be able to see uh, a civilization, whatever exists, like inhabitants of the moon, if you want. And of course, uh, he took it and he ran with it. Uh, and he produced a 17,000 word um, article, which was published in six installments in the August of 1835. So I don't know where I should start. Should I start with the whole uh, with the story or the reason why they published it? Or I, I, Well, I, I think we should tell a little bit more about, about the story itself as well, because um, it is a very, very interesting, um, a very interesting story to, to have out. And, you know, exactly what motivations they, they might have had for publishing it, we could probably debate for a while. Um, but it was a series of, of six stories um, as I, right. um, that came out in August of 1835. Exactly. Um, and they were published over time. And it did take, I think, about a month before they were roundly uh, sort of denounced as as um, as false. Yeah, it took a while. It took a while. And I mean, this was published in uh, what they called uh, penny periodicals uh, back then. So these penny periodicals uh, were um, basically cheap uh, newspapers, um, sort of like tabloid newspapers that we have with lots of images and just headlines. And their target was uh, primarily immigrants who wanted uh, simple language and uh, fun stories to read. And these penny periodicals were, of course, uh, only um, uh, co- uh, would cost them only one penny, while a regular newspaper uh, would cost six pence back then. So one of these penny periodicals was the Sun, the New York Sun, uh, that was uh, basically established in 1833. And um, it had an arch rival, uh, the New York Herald. And uh, these guys were actually competing over getting more advertisements. So, um, well, of course, the Herald was a lot more successful and it had a degree of financial independence, but Sun did not have it. So uh, the founder and uh, basically uh, the founder of um, the New York Sun, a man by the name of Ben, by the name Benjamin Jay, he hired a, a newly um graduate uh, from Cambridge by the name of Richard Adams Locks. Um, and um, Locks was, of course, um, uh, a descendant of the famous philosopher. Um, and uh, basically, uh, they wanted to find a way to increase the circulation of their paper. So, uh, here was uh, Richard's uh, idea. Let's publish a story here. And of course, as you mentioned uh, at the beginning, the, um, there was some debate as to whether this was really a hoax, like something that was fabricated to deliberately um, deceive people, or whether it was satire. And uh, later in his life, um, Locke mentioned that it was uh, satire. He meant to write satire, but people did not get it. People did not get the joke simply because everyone was so looking forward to a discovery of uh, life on the surface of the moon. But suffice to say that they were super successful in achieving a high circulation. So within 48 hours, the circulation of the New York Sun went from 8,000 to 19,360. So two and a half times larger within uh, 48 hours. Actually, it became the um, most uh, circulated uh, periodical in the whole world, Uh, even, uh, you know, taking over uh, the London Times. So, I mean, they were hugely successful simply because they were reporting on something that people were waiting for, for centuries, I would say, rather than years. 
So um, basically, the story, as you mentioned, um, came out in six installments. The first of it uh, was uh, on the 25th of August, uh, where, as you mentioned again, um, the uh, beginning, uh, like uh, the front page of The Sun uh, read great astronomical discoveries lately made by Sir John Herschel at the Cape of Good Hope. And I should mention that at this time, uh, Herschel was not in the Northern Hemisphere. He was actually in the Cape of Good um, Hope uh, in South Africa, uh, trying to uh, map the skies, uh, the Saturn skies. And so he had no idea that this is happening somewhere in the Northern Hemisphere. So, uh, basically, the first report was primarily uh, about uh, Herschel's new telescope. And uh, I should again mention that um, William Herschel, the father um, to John Herschel, was famous for building the most um, the largest telescopes and most advanced telescopes of the time. He was one of the, he was the best telescope maker in Europe, and um, John uh, inherited uh, all the telescopes that his father basically built, and he improved on them. So this article, the first installment uh, of the article, is talking about this huge telescope that Sir John has. It it, it has a lens that uh, weighs seven tons, and it has a magnifying power of 42,000 times. And people believed it because Herschel's were famous for having these huge um, telescopes. So, um, yeah, the first day, uh, basically... Maybe I, uh, I have a few quotes, actually, if you're interested uh, to hear from the actual article. So uh, it says that Sir John had already made the most extraordinary discoveries in every planet of our solar system, had discovered planets in other solar systems, had obtained a distinct view of objects in the moon, and, of course, had settled the question um, of uh, life on the moon. So the first day things uh, was not uh, very exciting, but the second day on August 26, they start talking about the discoveries that Herschel uh, has made uh, about uh, inhabitants of the moon. And um, as you mentioned, uh, they talk about um, these creatures uh, that are like bisons, uh, they are quadrupeds. They talk about uh, a goat that is uh, bluish in color and only has one horn. And they talk about, um, uh, you know, um, uh, certain beavers, (laughs) which appear to be intelligent. And even a certain amphibian that you haven't seen on Earth, uh, it is um, spherical and it moves with great velocity on pebbly beaches uh, on the surface of the moon. And so... um, I mean, they just go short um, of saying that there was intelligent life on the surface of the moon. And then now that they have grabbed the attention of people on the 27th, uh, they actually primarily talk about, um, you know, um, the geology and geography of the um, surface of the moon and, uh, you know, basically what kind of plants and what kind of mountains and things like that. So there is no talk of actual civilization or intelligent beings on the moon. By 28, people are standing in the streets of New York to get a copy of the sun. And on the 28th, they eventually announced that, yes, Sir John has observed these intelligent creatures, which they call um, basically the man bat. Um, Actually, uh, they had a very um, interesting name for them. Um, If I can pronounce it correctly, Vesperit Tilio Homo, or uh, the man bat rather than bat. Man. Um, and here's a description that is published uh, on August 28th in the sun of this creature. And I'm quoting from uh, that particular article. It says that these creatures averaged four feet in height, were covered except on the face with short and glossy copper colored hair, and had wings composed of thin membrane without hair, lying snugly upon their backs 
from the top of the shoulders to the calls of the legs. The face, which was of a yellowish flesh color, was a slight improvement upon that of the large orangutan, being more open and intelligent in its expression and having a much greater expansion of the forehead. In general symmetry of body and limbs, they were infinitely superior to orangutan. And then uh, they actually talk about the fact that these creatures were engaged in conversation and their gesticulation um, clearly shows that they are intelligent beings. So, of course, uh, you might be uh, thinking, okay, why would people actually believe such a thing? Well, they said that um, all of these, uh, basically the whole narrative is coming from um, a scientific publication in uh, a journal called um, Supplement to Edinburgh Journal of Science. Well, there was an Edinburgh Journal of Science, but it had ceased publication two years prior to the whole event in 1833. So they added the word supplement uh, to the whole um, uh, publication to make it, uh, to basically dispel any doubt that people might have. So, I mean, this continued. And eventually, they realized that now, the, uh, well, uh, we have announced the existence of intelligent beings. How are we going to continue with this? So um, on August 29th, basically, they talk about uh, the discovery of a significant temple, um, which was made of polished sapphire and had um, like a sphere uh, that was sitting in, um, in the middle of um, a set of uh, flames that were made by metal. And they were thinking about uh, the potential significance of um, uh, such a, a con uh, construct uh, on the surface of the moon. Was it religious or was it about uh, some sort of, um, you know, uh, memorial? Um, and then Locke realized that, okay, we have to finish this. We cannot go on. Um, and of course, by this time, uh, as I said, the publication, um, the number of um, the periodicals that we're selling were very, very high. It was the largest, um, uh, it was the best selling periodical, let's put it this way, on the surface of the earth. And in order to get an advertisement there, they had to, uh, people had to send their material before 6 p.m. or the sun uh, would not guarantee a space. I mean, it had become widely successful. So on August 31st, they want to finish it off and somehow stop this. So they say that, yes. So what happened was that they had um, basically lowered the telescope, but they had accidentally set it towards the east um, where the sun would rise the next day. And uh, that caused a fire uh, in the <laughs> observatory. So none oh, of uh, basically. So they um, they could not observe the stuff that they observed because of the damage that was uh, caused uh, by this fire to the observatory. And that was the end of it. Now, during this time, uh, the, there was actually a fire in the office of Herald, which was the arch rival of um, the Sun. And uh, their uh, editor uh, didn't have time to actually respond. But the moment that they settled down, they started accusing Sun of fabricating stories, and they said that the man behind this is Richard Adams Locke. And Locke kept saying, no, he denied it, he denied it. And as he was denying, uh, basically they started uh, publishing the whole um, six installments in the form of uh, pamphlets, and they sold 60,000 of those. And the interesting thing is that people believed it. I mean, no one. Uh, there were very few, I should say, who doubted it. In fact, um, there, there were, um, uh, this is very interesting. Uh, one clergy in America warned his congregation that he might have to solicit funds from them to send Bibles to the inhabitants of the moon. And it was also reported that the philanthropists of England, they had frequented and crowded meetings at Exeter Hall and appointed committees to inquire in regard to the condition of the people of the moon for the purpose of relieving their wants and above all, abolishing slavery if it should be found to exist among the lunar inhabitants. So anyhow, everyone believed it. And then, of course, at some point, the bubble burst and um, 
basically Locke said, yes, I authored this, but I did not mean a hoax. It was supposed to be a satire, but I mean, people, they have um, been basically, uh, they have come to a point that uh, they believe so much in this existence of life on the surface of uh, the moon and other planets, especially through religious sermons, that they cannot think anymore and they just take it for granted. So he's, in fact, laughing at uh, one of the most famous um, authors. Uh, theologian and uh, science authors of the time uh, by the name of Thomas Dick, uh, who actually wrote a lot about existence of life elsewhere in the universe. I mean, in the solar system, on the moon, he actually, this um, Thomas Dick, he published a table of the population of the inhabitants of the solar system. And um, his measurement uh, was um, assumed that um, all the other planets are all land and uh, there is no sea, so you could Inha- uh, basically the inhabitants could live everywhere and his measurements was based on the average number of people who lived at the time in England uh, per square feet and he ended up uh, with, uh, if I'm not mistaken, with a figure of uh, 4,200,000,000 inhabitants for the surface of the moon. So really uh, Locke's um, target was to laugh at people like Thomas Dick, who were using religion in the service of science and science in the service of religion. But I mean, no one apparently got his joke. And this episode ended up uh, being called uh, the Great Moon Hoax, uh, because (laughs) a lot of people thought that, yes, uh, he made it up. But sooner or later, life is going to be discovered on the surface of the moon. So yeah, that's the story of the Great Moon Hoax. Amazing. Yeah, and it it really is so fun. And there are some really fun little things in there. So I think I, I would 100% recommend anybody who's interested to go out and actually read the um, the articles, the six articles themselves, because they, um, there's some really interesting stuff in there. As as you mentioned, they had this massive telescope lens that they suppose Herschel supposedly constructed a 24 foot diameter seven ton <laughs> seven <laughs> tons yeah piece of glass seven tons 24 feet in diameter and he carted it from england to south africa exactly right yeah. like um that's that's uh <laughs> so he it broke all the laws of glass yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> It's a, a, a glass, mind you, glass lens. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, uh, well, all this is happening. Herschel has no idea uh, that he must uh, have come back to so many, so many letters. <laughs> I, well, yeah, well, um, when he saw a copy of the newspaper, he laughed at it first, but apparently, uh, he they were really annoyed afterwards because they got inquiry after inquiry after inquiry, and it was becoming a nuisance, you know, it was just beyond. <laughs> Uh, like a uh, scientific discovery. And uh, no matter how much he said, no, I have nothing to do with this thing. Apparently people still were inquiring. So oh, yeah. They still want to find those, those single horned goats. Yes, that's right. That's right. Um, yeah, there were actually lots and lots of uh, imaging. So if you go and search on the net, you're going to see some of these really, really fun uh, images um, of... Um, I mean, the inhabitants of the moon. Um, and uh, I mean, it is, it, is, it is quite a story. It is quite a story. And really funny that no one got uh, Locke's joke. Uh, everyone believed it. Even uh, students at Yale, uh, professors at Yale, uh, and a lot of newspapers, um, in fact, uh, published uh, statements saying that, uh, like, I, 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 in front of me, I have a quote from... Uh, uh, one newspaper which says it appears 
referring to the story, uh, to carry intrinsic evidence of being an authentic document. And then another oh, one says, no article we believe has appeared for years that will command so general a pursual and publication. Sir John has added a stock of knowledge to the present age that will immortalize his name and place it high on the page of science. Oh my so, God. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> everyone yeah. believed it. Oh my goodness. <laughs> well, there, I'm sure there were a few skeptics out there, but um, I, I do like how they, they, you know, you would have to be reading skeptically to pick this up because when they, you know, like I say, it's a, now we might look at that and go 24 foot diameter glass. Hmm. But <laughs> if you don't, if you don't go hum and you don't read it skeptically or you don't read it really like you don't you don't actually read all the words it sounds it sounds okay it sounds interesting and in that sense it's a great exercise of you know read this critically and 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 see what pops out and it's a, it's a wonderful critical reading exercise actually i think it is it is it was and i mean uh, we should um, as i said uh, also note when it was read like the time and where it was read and the space and i mean um the majority at the time when this came out uh, many of the sermons were uh, talking about uh basically um these um extraterrestrials that they were looking for the inhabitants of the moon inhabitants of the mars and even uh, like uh, the table that i mentioned that uh, thomas dick published he was even <laughs> populating the rings of saturn so i mean this is <laughs> oh, becoming my. fanatical and they kept saying okay what is the purpose why would god create all these things and not populate them because clear like Saturn doesn't uh, serve any purpose uh, for us or uh, <laughs> I mean um, uh, Jupiter is not <laughs> serving any purpose so they should be there for a reason God doesn't create in vain so they sh started actually populating all these bodies and um, I mean uh, they ca they came up with these ridiculous uh, figures in his <laughs> in his table and of course moon as i said ended up with a population of more than four billion inhabitants uh so people were hearing these uh from the pulpits everywhere and they believed it they believed that yes finally herschel put an end into this um debate as to whether um the moon is uh basically inhabited or not and they thought that yes this is the answer and we got it eventually so anyhow uh, it, uh, as, as you said, it is a very good exercise in reading things uh, critically and uh, being skeptical about uh, whatever you hear. <laughs> I, I keep looking at this uh, portrait of a man bat. Right. And it's, it's wings. And I keep thinking, that's not how bat wings work. <laughs> right? Like, well, how, how big of wings would you need on moon gravity, though? Well, I mean, the thing is, they have the wings. They have like a membrane spreading from the arm of the, the, the bat, the man bat, down to its thigh. And if you know anything about the biology of a bat, it's like the, the hand of a, the wing of a bat is if you take like all your fingers except your thumb and elongate them. That's the bones in the wing of a bat, but he exactly. still has he still has his normal hand. He just has these extra random bones sticking out of his back into <laughs> these membranes, and like that, this is not how it works. But I guess you would have to know something about bat biology to like look at that drawing and go, "That's not right." Yeah, um, exactly. And I, I, I mean, even today, drawings, most were, people probably wouldn't catch that. Yeah, and, and the drawings were made, you know, after, I think most of the drawings were made after the publication, because the publication did include a couple lithographs, but there's also a lot of what's called, like, I mean, basically fan art, right? Yes, um, that's right. That's right. So, so much, much fan art. Later. 